So welcome to, tonight, to this evening's conversation with Dr. Jackie Huggins and Claire Halliday. Um, this presentation is a collaboration between Latrobe, Miley and East Gippsland Library Services. Um, before we start, some housekeeping. Could you please keep your microphones on mute? Um, there's a mic symbol on the bottom of your screen. Press it on to off. Um, our preference is for you to turn it off your video as well. Um, there's a chat function, the speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen, and you can ask any questions using that feature. Um, we'll have questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, now, the session is being recorded, so you will receive a copy um, once we're able to send that out. So I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging the tradi traditional custodians of the land which we meet today, wherever that may be. At present, I'm standing on Gunai Kurnai land, so I'd like to acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai people and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Jackie Huggins talk with us and Claire Halliday. Jackie ja Dr. Jackie Huggins is an Aboriginal Australian author, historian, uh, academic and advocate for rights of Indigenous Australians. She's published a wide range of essays and studies dealing with Indigenous history and identity. She is the author of Sister Girl and co-author with her mother, Rita, of the critically acclaimed biography, uh, Auntie Rita. Jackie, Huggin, uh, Jackie Huggins has worked for a number of, um, on a number of working groups um, in helping Indigenous um, committees and things like that. So she's got lots of um, experience in that area as well. Um, she, her and her sister Nairi um, wrote the story of their father, Jack, who had spent three years as a Japanese prisoner of war, as a Japanese prisoner of war during World War II and was forced to work around, was to work around along with 13,000 13, others on the Burma Thailand Railway. The book entitled Jack of Hearts was published in 2022. Jack was not treated badly upon his return as many Aboriginal diggers were and became the first Aboriginal man to work for Australia Post, the first Aboriginal surf lifesaver in air in the 1930s and the only Indigenous man to play rugby league both before and after the war. Um, tonight, Claire Halliday will be um, interviewing um, Dr. Jackie Huggins. Um, Claire's a freelance writer, has been a freelance writer for 25 years and has an author herself, and she's written five of her own nonfiction books, um, which have been published. Um, she's done a lot of interviews with Australian identity, identities, exploring the impact of nature versus nurture. I'll now pass you over to Claire and Jackie. Thank you, and thanks to the um, conglomeration, the collaboration of libraries, regional libraries in Victoria that have made this event possible. It's great to be able to talk online and bring a featured author, Dr. Jackie Huggins, who is beaming into us from somewhere else completely. Welcome, Jackie. Thanks very much, Claire. Good to be here. Now, um, you had a very impressive intro. You've done a lot and achieved a lot, but we are here mainly to talk about one of your books primarily because it is Remembrance Day at the end of the week on Friday and um, around Anzac Day this year when your book Jack of Hearts came out, I listened to an interview that you were doing with ABC Radio and it just really captured my attention. I've got a bit of an interest in World War II history, both of two of my uncles, my mum's brothers both served. And so I'm always a bit fascinated. And obviously this is, you know, another perspective because it's the perspective of an Indigenous serviceman who, as was touched on in the intro, had a, a unique experience though coming back as an Indigenous, uh, Indigenous serviceman. There's a lot to dig into in the talk, but firstly, for the people who haven't yet read Jack of Hearts, and I'll get you to hold up the book cover at the end so people can make sure they they know what to look for at their local library or their bookstore. Sure. Um, your, your father sounded like a remarkable man in, in many ways, a much loved and much respected man in his community and obviously by his family. But it is a unique story about, um, you know, what happened to him, I guess, in, in the World War II experience, what happened to him afterwards. But let's go back before the war. Jack Huggins, very impressive full name, 
John Henry Huggins III. He was a popular sportsman and he was one of the first Aboriginal surf lifesavers in Australia, or was it the first? Uh, possibly the first, because I, I, I don't recall anyone um, that goes back that far, Claire. So paint us a picture of him, because in the book you do have so many beautiful photos and a very striking portrait of him too on the cover. He's a mm. handsome man. Tell us about his physicality and his sporting mm. prowess. Who was, who was he? Okay, uh, uh, John Henry Huggins III, um, known as Jack, or um, he's actually, actually, his parents called him Jackie and close friends called him Jackie too. And just recently, uh, when we went back to Air, um, North Queensland, to launch his book, there were a lot of people calling him Jackie. So, um, and my mother did say to, uh, he did say to my mother, um, if we don't have a a boy next time, we'd uh, that already had one girl, and um, uh, he said call her call her Jackie just in case. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get back to that story a little later, but um, in answer to your question, he was six foot tall, dark and handsome, and every. Um, uh, sense of the word he was a great athlete and uh, he played a grade uh, rugby league back in those days and would you believe he also played uh, a grade rugby league a few years after he came back from the war so um, you know recovering from his terrible uh, POW uh, injuries his physicality um, um, obviously changed, but um, he got himself back into great health and played um, uh, played football in the um, uh, around about nineteen forty eight. Um, yeah, so you know, three years after the war, um, which was pretty special. He was um, uh, a, a man of um, of great strength and. We believe that the youngest and the, um, or not so much the youngest, but the fittest soldiers were sent up to the Burma Railway uh, at that time. So um, that was pretty um, impressive, I guess, but very bad luck on his part that yeah. he was so so um, uh, so young and uh, he was about twenty two. Uh, when he went there so uh, he he uh, enlisted when he was 19 uh, but went to war uh, when he was 22 but um, yes you know you you as you said the um, um, uh, the cover of the book and uh, the photos in there really do allude to you know what what a what a strong uh, beautiful man he was and that was on the outside and the inside as um, as we came to uh, know from our mother's stories, particularly because she was our primary source material uh, for my sister, Nairi Jaro and I, uh, to write the book. We co-authored it together as daughters and as sisters. So mm. this has been our first venture together. I've written books before, but uh, for her, 27 years a teacher. Um, this was her first go. Yeah. And, and it must have been, you know, confronting, enlightening, emotional, the process of exploring his story because his POW experiences, you know, arguably, well, not arguably, I guess, you know, shortened his life and, and he did die too young and you were only two when he died. I'm just wondering how much of your memories of him you actually hold on to and how much perhaps have been just, you know, the family folklore that mm. that your mother worked so hard to keep his memory alive for you being so young? Yeah, that's a great question, Claire, and I've often pondered this myself, but I do have really um, uh, deep memories of him um, as, uh, as a very young child, of course, you know, coming home and... Um, uh, coming home from work and putting me on his shoulders and stooping underneath the front door 
of the little cottage that we had and uh, our, you know, sibling rivalry, Sister Nari was three years of age then and we would fight over who got to uh, get to him first <laughs> coming through the door. So um, I do have those very solid um, memories of particularly those events. Nothing much else after that except, um, you know, the, the, the stories that uh, our mother gave us in terms of, uh, you know, the places we went to the beach, down, down the road was the beach, um, and, you know, having picnics and so forth. So there was obviously, you know, a little bit of that. Um, my, um, uh, my sister does remember little bits and pieces uh, as well, uh, particularly, you know, when she hit me in the head with a hoe um, <laughs> when we were gardening, that's in the book. <laughs> and uh, that, yeah, that for me too was a, a, quite a memory because I, I do remember, um, uh, you know, bleeding and um, uh, feeling very distressed about that. But um, Well, I'm going to dig into more of your your memories of your father and I just want to go back to you know you've you've painted this this picture of a, a beautiful man a loved man a man of great strength like you said obviously a very physically fit and able-bodied uh, active man and so when he was 19 he decided to join up hmm. which was not unusual at that time in the Australian culture and the, and the patriotism and so many young men wanted to make that decision too but I guess it wasn't as simple to sign up and, and enlist as an Aboriginal man especially at a time in Australian history where Aboriginal people had so few basic rights in so many ways it's sort of I guess a bit staggering to think you know why would he have been so willing to fight for king and country at that time when perhaps it might not have been the choice of others in his position it wasn't just a simple case of him going I want to enlist he had to kind of jump through some extra hoops didn't he as an indigenous man to do that yes he certainly did like all the other indigenous uh, men and uh, the first hoop was that they had to prove that uh, they were substantially white and that is a piece in the um, in, in the um, enrollment um forms that uh, Aboriginal men had to prove that uh, the heritage was more white than black. But, you know, you see in photos now that where you have very dark Aboriginal men, such as the men who went from Sherberg, the, the mission where my mother's from, and other places, they were, were uh, very dark skinned. So I don't know how, and they tried, they absolutely tried to get into the service and into the defence force, and somehow uh, they were able uh, to do that. Um, now, uh, fighting for you know king and country at that time was very much you know in in uh, the male domain is very very much uh, um, uh, the men in Australia uh, wanted to do that. And as you know, as as you as you know too. Um, we had many relations, our, our uncles um, and um, uh, the males actually um, went to war. Well, w w went and served in the Defence Force. Um, we put it down, probably our grandfather was in World War I. He'd fought there, um, got wounded twice in Belgium. So your dad's father, that is. My dad's father, yes, yeah. that's right. And we thought that um, we, we made the summation that uh, our father went to war to emulate his father uh, as well because he was his father's son. He was a man's man and um, uh, just adored. They adored each other, my grandmother, my grandfather, and they had one child. And my father uh, was the one child, whereas my mother comes from a family of 15 siblings. So right. <laughs> that's the, that was the extent of that. And even the timing of that, I guess, was not uncommon just because of the way general, generationally World War I and then World War II came along a generation later. So it was the sons of the fathers who had served in, in the First World War that were sort of wanting, as you say, to emulate their dads in so many cases, I imagine. 
Yes, absolutely. And the research around the uh, Aboriginal soldiers was that, yes, very much the case. Um, the sons usually followed the fathers. So, um, uh, but, but the whole irony, of course, Claire, was uh, that, that they weren't even citizens of their own country. Yeah. And didn't become citizens for many decades later. No, no, so no, imagine, you know, that must have been a very frustrating and sort of a puzzling thing, I guess, for you in some of, you know, the work that you've done, which is about advocacy and, mm -hmm. and exposing, you know, the, the lack of freedoms and the lack of rights, you know, in, in so many sectors of the Indigenous community. It must have been puzzling for you to go, why did you do that, Dad? <laughs> like, Oh, yes, Claire, I ask my, I've always asked myself that question, you know. It's given me some comfort after writing the book, of course, because it helped explain a whole lot of stuff. But uh, I was feeling, you know, especially when I was quite younger and around his age when he died, which was um, 38 when he died, and I, th I thought, what, why did you do this? You know, why did you go and fight in a needless war as far as I was concerned and left us, you know, without a, a, a father? when uh, we obviously needed you here. And my mother just, um, well, you know, well, she never got over it. She absolutely grieved her whole life uh, for our father. Because even when he came back, he wasn't the same man that he went away as. Because as we have touched on before, and, you know, what is obviously a core part of the book was that Jack was taken prisoner with the fall of Singapore, became one of the thousands of Australian servicemen, including at least five other Aboriginal servicemen who were forced to work as slave labour to build the Thai Burma Railway. So he did make it back to air after the war. He became the first Indigenous Australian, as was said, to work in the post office how different a man was he, though, from, from, I guess, the family folklore, as you say, your mother's grief? But since writing the book, I imagine you've, you've dug more into people that knew the before Jack and the after Jack. What, what was lost in his mm. life, war experience? Mm. Well, um, obviously, when he, um, he came back, he was... Uh, uh, he, uh, the greatest loss, really, of his life came when um, uh, two years into the war, uh, his father died. Three months before the war ended, his mother died. So there he was, an orphan, when he came back from war. Um, and we believe he fainted at the railway station when his best mate um, picked him up. He just, I think the reality must have just hit him, um, just, you know, getting back on home soil just absolutely um, struck him uh, down. He um, also, um, uh, because of the family standing in that little town, sugarcane town of Ayr, uh, it, it was amazing because um, he'd now lost his parents um, and the whole town actually surrounded him and enveloped him in, with their love. And he had a car, he had a house, um, uh, he didn't have a family then. And then uh, not long after he got that job in, in the post office. So that was very... Um, Fortunate. He was a remarkable and uh, exceptional um, man because the family was, uh, you know, so exceptional in terms of their standing within the local uh, community. You know, in the 1930s, I mean, that was pretty harsh times for our people, you know. For instance, on the outskirts of Ear were town camps. They were in squalor. They were holding pens for Aboriginal uh, people to be shipped off onto the missions and to the reserves. Uh, my father and his family escaped that. So they were more like the town blacks and, to our knowledge, the only Aboriginal family in the town. Um, uh, by that time, you know, some South Sea Islander people had come in to cut the sugar, sugar cane and so forth. 
uh, and Italians, the great big Italian population there too, which they blended in uh, nicely with. But for our people, it was a different story um, outside um, that little cocoon that they lived in because, you know, here we had the Aborigines uh, Sale and Protection uh, of Open, Opium Act in the 19, um, uh, that would have been 1897. And that was the year they were starting to ship off uh, people onto missions and reserves. That, that went through right up until the 1950s. So um, uh, somehow uh, they probably saw all this happening, but there was very little uh, they could do about it. So um, here they were really essentially, you know, leading um, quite assimilated lives in um in that little town of Eel, whereas, you know, my mother's story was a very different story. Mm. She was on Sherberg Aboriginal Mission. Mm. But for your father, it was, like you said, that, that, that freedom and that cocoon in this loving little community where the mm. family was respected. And then suddenly he's a prisoner of war, far, far away. Although, weirdly, in a setting that had the familiarity, as, as you talk about in the book, when you go back and visit these key sites, has the sugar cane. I guess that sort of connects or maybe connected him in some, I don't know if it would have been a comforting way or was mm -hmm. it comforting to you when you went back to the sites where he served as a POW and saw that same sugar cane that, that surrounded, you know, the safety of the home that he loved where he grew up in Australia. Yes, and the humidity of the um, place that we visited in Malaysia and and um, and Thailand too, you know, it was very hot. And um, you know, we're North Queenslanders, and uh, we can face those those kind of temperatures. But yeah, there's a little bit in the book where we put that, um, you know, when we took the um, uh, the, the bus up to uh, going up towards the the Burma railway. Uh, there were fields of sugarcane there. And, and we thought, we tried to put ourselves back in his place to think, what would he have thought? You know, was he comforted by that, as you say? You know, did he really, um, uh, you know, seeing the sugarcane which surrounded the, and still does surround the township uh, of air, um, uh, that must have been a a comforting thought for him. So we would have hoped it, it, it would be. But, uh, yeah, just walking in those footsteps was really powerful. And so what did you learn about his daily life as a POW through, as you say, walking those footsteps, revisiting those sites? It's a journey that a lot of, you know, children or, or grandchildren, descendants of veterans yeah. go on looking for something, closure for themselves or just a greater understanding. I'm just wondering how much you learned about his daily life as a POW through the book and that experience? Or how much did you feel like you already knew? As no, we, well? we knew some parts, but we didn't know the extent and particularly the extent of the diseases that were uh, very apparent. And um, he probably got all of them from beriberi to malaria to tropical ulcers. We know he got this thing called... Um, uh, strocolitis, which is, um, it can affect um, the heart uh, as well and um, uh, probably weakened it. He would have had a very strong heart uh, up until that time. But the, uh, and we researched what the camps would have looked like. We were taken to the camps, actually. Some of the old, they're all overgrown now or they've got markets there you know especially near the um uh, uh bridge over the river Kwai um where they were bombed um that's a market almost like a marketplace now but we were taken down to a uh, a river where they where the camps were where they bathed and where they uh you know uh, got themselves clean after a whole day's work but they would have to, and there was a bit of a hill, a bit of a um, uh, descent that they would come back from, sleep, and then have to go very early in the morning back up that hill to um, 
uh, to go to the railway line. Um, and those camps were very much Spartan, uh, you know, uh, there's photos in the book of uh, the little bamboo huts and uh, where they slept. They would have been, uh, you know, bitten by mosquitoes horribly and other insects. Um, and uh, rations really, you know, the um, uh, Japanese Imperial Army kept most of the best food for themselves and uh, handed out the rations and uh, the poor bits of meat uh, and stew and rice that the soldiers had to um, had to eat. It was the only form of sustenance, and no wonder, you know, they came back looking like Biafran people after after their um, their stay there. But the camps were very uh, uh, incredibly uh, uh, they were squalor, but the Australian soldiers did their best to keep it clean. You know, they would just meticulously wipe the um, uh, the urns and the, uh, you know, the, um, the cutlery and so forth. So they would not get typhoid, which was obviously uh, raging through, through uh, many of the um, prisoner of war camps at that time. And surviving such a notorious prisoner of war camp was a feat in itself because sadly, you know, so many people didn't. Mm. Your father, as you say, had so many physical scars from this experience, um, obviously emotional scars too. It was really common for anybody, you know, going through those those times in that culture, in that, in that setting in history that they didn't come back and share with their wives or, mm. you know, their family. But for your dad, his friendships with his war mates were really pivotal and that was something that your mother sort of understood and, and accepted. Tell us about that and what more you learnt about the strength and the importance of those relationships for him going yes. through that, trying to pick up life again after the war. Mm. Well, as I said before, he was very much uh, a man's man, um, very masculine, um, he was uh, obviously, um, uh, he had a great sense of humour and he was able to um, uh, be a leader in, in terms of, you know, being a man that uh, uh, was not afraid to, to take on um, various uh, responsibilities and roles. And actually we found a piece in the... Um, uh, Doug McLagan, his name was, he had written a book and a diary about his time there. And it was like a treasure, you know, finding this piece that said, I knew Jack Huggins, something like he was a stout fella um, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a better man anybody could, could meet, uh, handsome and unafraid. So that was uh, very reassuring for us because... Um, uh, we we knew he was uh, uh, like that. He um, uh, he also uh, was able to um, uh, you know build friendships, and he's all, he he always had those friendships, even from the young surf lifesavers to uh, playing football. Um, he had his mates, all encompassing. They worked together. They did. Um, uh, did everything. Actually, they followed each other over to the war in, in, even. We found this later um, by some people um, uh, when we had our book launch in air in uh, July, um, we got people to tell up, get up and tell their stories. And there were beautiful stories of him being, um, you know, welcomed, but also being... Um, uh, being able to, you know, kind of be the best mate that uh, their fathers ever had. And there was, I must tell this story, though, there was uh, one woman, she said her father at 17 followed father over to the war. Um, great mates. Uh, when he returned, um, and years later, this lady's uh, father uh, wanted my father to be his best man but his father's father the grandfather of her would not allow it because of the color 
Yes, yes, because of his colour. And she said, uh, we're still in touch today and we sort of we felt we found another kindred spirit. And uh, next weekend, actually, we're going up to uh, stay at her place because one of the um, gentlemen who gave us some information about our dad's um, rugby league career, uh, he's just done a book and he'll be launching his book um, Martin Grandellis on the air footballers um, of um, of the many years. So um, uh, you know those uh, those mateships. There was a ninety three year old also who turned up. He's quite younger than my father, uh, ten years younger in fact, and uh, he remembers you know when he was in hospital with war. Uh, sorry, with his footy injuries, my father was always there. Uh, as a carer, you know, taking care of him, him taking care of him too. Um, but the baitship, I think, is really uh, extraordinary um, for these diggers, for all of them, you know, um, particularly the POWs who had that specific experience of what they went through and they couldn't, horrific, as horrific as it was, they couldn't discuss it with anybody else except their mates, you know. And that mateship, you can you can just tell, the, you know, the level of generations that that's come through. Um, it's quite an amazing thing. And uh, we know that our boys have it too with their mates. They're uh, very, um, uh, you know, very wedded to their mates in terms of loyalty and, um, and honesty and uh, true friendship. So, um, so that's been a a good quality that's uh, that has carried through through to our families. We've talked a little bit about, I guess, the the divide between you know Indigenous and white in Australia and what was happening sort of socially and politically. I guess around that, mm -hmm. evident by what you said about you know this sad story about somebody who's obviously seen your dad just as an excellent human being, just a, mm -hmm. a great mate, and and saw no colour and had no need to see colour, but then, you know, that racism is just niggling away at the background. Yeah. Is there any sort of um, evidence that, you know, the Japanese saw colour and that the Indigenous people were treated in any um, harsher way? Because at the time, obviously, the Japanese were were not the, the, the kind people that you wanted to be their prisoners of. There was a lot of cruelty. And yes. I'm just wondering if um, your exploration of that wartime history uncovered any sort of additional cruelty for, for people of colour within the Australian forces? Yeah, yes, when you, know, you wouldn't have thought that would be the case, but uh, their cruelty was more extreme to the coloured um, soldiers uh, from what we can, uh, what we can find. Uh, in fact, um, the Japanese had a, a, a great uh, dislike for the Indian soldiers and there were many Indian soldiers that served uh, as well on the uh, on on the railway and uh, throughout the war and our father who had uh, quite dark skin then um, uh, could have been uh, mistaken for um, uh, for an Indian man um, they spared no mercy, um, but some said the Korean ga guards were even worse um, than, uh, than the Japanese. But um, uh, there's a story in the book, and we try, or we've tried to uh, let other um, uh, POWs, but also men who'd served on the railway, talk about their experience. And um, some of one of my friends from WA said that. Um, uh, his father was constantly beaten because uh, they thought he was Indian. And uh, another, um, uh, as well, um, our friend Garth's uncle was, uh, was beaten also regularly uh, because they didn't believe there were any black people in Australia. <laughs> so, um, no, that was very, uh, very cruel and very brutal to the extent that, um, uh, well, you know, quite clearly my father had no time for the Japanese and um, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, he, he couldn't bring himself to speak about them. Uh, 
uh, let alone as a, a as a race of people. Now, the irony of this is that uh, when we went on the tour to um, the railway, when we went over there uh, pre-COVID, um, our um, our guide who was who's attached to the War Mem Memorial, Garth O'Connell, uh, had a friend there, and she's a Japanese woman. And the first thing she did, she came on the journey with us. She came to us and she apologised. She said, I want to say I'm sorry for what um, my people did in the Second World War. And um, I'm so sorry you lost your father when you were so young. So, you know, that kind of, <sighs> we breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> And uh, we thought, yeah, the world has changed. And we've got to we've got to move on with that, and uh, really know that we they were working in different context and climate in those days to, you know, what we see now in terms mm. of um, opening it up to a broader um, multicultural world that we have now and that we exist in. So um, I don't, I certainly don't harbour any uh, ill feelings. I mean, I'm very sad about it, but, um, you know, you have to put it in the context of which it was. But my father never forgave, would never forgive the Japanese. Of course, who would know what might have happened to him, you know, had he been given the luxury of just ageing? Um, yes. Because sometimes people change over time but I guess we'll never know and he would have good reason at the time to have the feelings that mm. he did obviously I mean it's an unpleasant history for anybody to dig into you know what goes on how prisoners of war are treated and what goes on in the nitty-gritty of war it's it's mm. not pleasant reading for anybody but when it's your own father it must be extraordinarily difficult especially when your own memories of him are so I mean, powerful, but still so few and, and not very, you know, there's not much longevity, I guess, in your memories of him. So what were some of the most challenging parts of, of researching and writing this book for both you and your sister? Yes, well, um, um, I'm because I'm, I'm the historian, we're given, we both did different parts of mm. writing the book, which was good. It kind of... Um, was that we were able to make the flow uh, with that. And um, the difficult part, there were two difficult parts, I think. The first one was doing the military history, of which um, uh, I said, look, I'm a historian, but I don't do military history. <laughs> so I asked uh, our friend Garth, could he recommend um, somebody who would delve into the archives and to trove into all the wonderful records um, and do that sort of detail. And we found this wonderful woman called Katrina Cattell from uh, Port Stephens, uh, and uh, she got onto it. And she had just written a book called uh, uh, Shooting Through about her father, who was a POW interned in Italy in the Second World War. So she knew where to go and, um, uh, you know, not necessarily had the story of our Indigenous mob, but she soon uh, picked that up really well. So uh, the military history, because the, the records were so scant, um, were unable to know even where he went, where he went north, south or east. So uh, quite often in there we would have to guess um, an educated guess to think well you know perhaps well he couldn't have gone there because there were floods or something you know I'm not saying there were floods but uh, uh, so, some other catastrophe was happening or you know they they couldn't get through to the roads um, but because they they were making the roads themselves um, but the military history was very hard, um, hard to write. But having said that too, um, one of Nairi's friends said um, her son had did, done a, um, a an essay for um, on w World War II in the um, uh, for his school, and his mother gave him the book, and she asked, you know, how did you go? How did you like the book? He said, yes, but I wish they would have put more about the military history of in there. <laughs> But we didn't want it to make it like a 
military history book. We wanted to make it more of a, you know, a life story, yeah. uh, something, and that people didn't need to, um, uh, it wasn't too hard to delve into, you mm -hmm. know, and to, to make it uh, to make it like that. So, um, so that was the first thing. And the other one was absolutely um, writing and researching about the diseases and quite uh, terrible, disgusting diseases that they all got, obviously, yeah. and came back home with. Um, some did better than others. I mean, you know, the men that lived into their 90s, well, um, it certainly unfortunately didn't happen for our father and a lot of them. Um, many of them died young, um, but the Aboriginal soldiers, POWs in my book, um, they lived to good ages, you know, well, you know, 70 is good for us. And uh, yeah, there, there were a couple there that lived, you know, into their 70s and 80s, which was, you know, quite astounding. Um, and you get a little bit envious when you think, oh, gosh, you know, could have been our dad, but yeah. we weren't so fortunate. Mm. Now, I want to make sure that in case anybody in the audience listening does have a question, we've got time to go to them. So if anybody does have a question that they'd love to put to you, they could type it into the chat now and we'll get to that in yeah. a few more minutes. I just had a couple more questions myself, though. Sure. Um, you know, I've asked you about what the challenging parts of exploring history were, but there must have also been, I guess, some joys within it. And I'm just wondering how your exploration exploration of your dad's life changed I guess your own relationship with with the memories you have of your mm -hmm. father what what are the positives what have you learned more about him because you're painting a picture of a strong man like I said you know respected loved you know people talk so glowingly about him in so many ways and mm -hmm. and you're part of that so yes. what did what did it give you what was the happy side of this research Yes, well, it did reinforce already, you know, what our mother told us all, all her life. In fact, she spoke daily about him. She would say things and, you know, to the point we'd go, oh, mum, you know, uh, here we go again, <laughs> please. Um, yeah, we'd heard that story, but we just let her go. You know, she'd go off and go into this kind of trance when she was talking about him. Um, and... Uh, you know, the oral history was really powerful in that sense um, uh, because um, uh, most of it was correct. Well, all of it, really. Um, and we used to think she was such a romanticist and, you know, prone to exaggeration sometimes, but it really it really wasn't that after, you know, um, looking at... Um, uh, you know some of the written record with the with the um uh the oral history um of it all and we thought yeah well that that fits there you know that that actually she said that and there it is you know like my grandfather wounded twice in belgium there it was in the historical military records you know <laughs> um we thought i thought it was pretty fanciful but uh no it, it was so true so that so that was good about and we could hear her voice again and we could hear those stories and hear her uh telling us what it was this was being this has been really evidenced by um what the man he was was all those stories that we've heard from um uh, people who knew him or their parents, you know, and just the extraordinary um, telling of those. I don't think there was anybody who actually said, you know, one bad word. He had rescued a man in a swollen uh, river one time, became a, you know, a bit of a local hero there. Um, and we did. We tried to, um, you know, he's, of course, a young man, a bit of a larrikin. We know that. <laughs> um but um you know and he had uh, lots of girlfriends and and um yeah, he's able to um uh when he met my mum um well that was it and uh, she always said that um you know she uh so proud to be his wife so yeah so so there was all all that um and that's a lot because you know, like you say, she was grieving the loss of this larrikin, this charismatic, oh. handsome, dashing, you know, man that people admired and loved. And, and he didn't come back 
the yeah. same. And so it must have given you a deeper understanding of the woman that your mother became and how she mothered you too. Yes, yes. Well, um, um, uh, Dame Quentin Bryce launched our book at the Anzac uh, Gallery, um, Anzac Square here in Brisbane. And she described the story as an epic love story. And it, and it truly, truly is, you know. They were just together for seven years, but she'd met him before the war, before he went away to the war and after when he came back um, because he was receiving uh, medical attention at Greenslope's um, repatriation hospital here. So, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it has been and... Um, uh, it's just uh, it's just been so great to have honoured you know both mother and father in their stories yes for sure and I want to say it's probably the first in Australia uh, well certainly in our Indigenous world and probably in Australia but probably one of the women at the Sydney Writers Festival who was interviewing me said she thinks it's probably the first uh, in the world where uh, a daughter has written both the biographies of mother and father. So oh, that's a nice little um, accolade. Yeah. <laughs> Not like you've got, an, you've got many, many accolades. To yes, yeah. a good one, it's a brave woman to do so too, I might add. <laughs> well, it's a brave woman to write two books at once, which I want to ask you about too, because that's kind of yes. crazy. But yeah, first I will right. see if there are any questions from the audience while we've been talking about the story of your much love, Dad, and Jack of Hearts. Lovely library ladies, are there any questions from the audience that we can come to or shall Jackie and I keep talking? Because you can tell we can. We can. <laughs> it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Um, it's fine because I have many questions yeah. myself, which one of which was about the writing process because yes. you said that you did write this, you co-authored it with your sister. Yes. And you've... you've you just gave me that little snapshot of saying, oh, well, you know, we, we sort of tackled it from different sides. But as a writer, I'd love to know a little bit more about that nitty gritty process of who wrote what and how you assigned the tasks to one another. To create okay. Yeah, so to put it in its context, this was during COVID when we had those lockdowns. So we had a lot of time on our hands. Yes. She would come, she lives five minutes away from me. And she would come down and we would have cups of tea. We just do the tea and go through the whole, where can we do this? We had a wonderful um, um, friend, uh, uh, Alison Ravenscroft from um, uh, uh, Melbourne also, who um, assisted us in terms of the structure uh, of it because Alison had been my editor for my first book, Auntie Rita. So she knew she knew the story, she knew the situation um, backwards. And uh, we would, okay, type it up and send it to her and have a look at this. What do you think? And she said, well, there's too much of, she would say, you know, there's too much of, um, um, of this in there and, and not much of that. So just, you know, fill it out where, where you can. Um, and I know for Nari it was difficult because this was her first time writing a book and we're with, a, shall I call ourselves, seasoned writers. <laughs> we kind of, we, we get a hunch around what publishers or, you know, would might want want to see or editors and what they would go for. So um, um, I was very keen to write and to do the history camp, uh, component um, Nari uh, is also, she loves to write the, about the feelings and, um, you know, and the family stuff. It's very, uh, very good at weaving that, that in as well. Um, but you've got to have both for the book. We knew that. We, we knew. So we assigned ourselves these um, certain sections and then we'd do the chapter first and then send it out. Uh, send it away and Alison would look at it and um, bring it back to us but you know in between with well I worked with Katrina to really um, and Katrina's a librarian and a teacher and um, a great woman she has a history background um, so she and I worked on that primarily together uh, alone and then we fed it uh, into the book um, and Nari has no qualms about that um, so it was a, it's my first really time of that real co-authorship, you know. Um, 
uh, we're still friends. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. It can we're be still friends. A yeah, challenging thing to do. If in anything, it brought us closer together. If there yeah. could be, you know, we've got a great relationship uh, as well. But, but as um, I touched on, also, you know, yeah. while you're managing that, you're writing another book at the same time as you yeah. were writing Jack of Hearts, or yes. or that came out within yes. a couple. Of months. So tell us a little bit about that book as well. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, I um, we're doing that, and now my sister girl book is a. I, I wrote it. I wrote the first one in 1998, and um, uh, I've I've uh, written this one. Uh, the publishers, I, I could see that there'd been a trend and people wanting to, you know, kind of revise and you know, bring their books up after uh, after years later. So I said to the publishers, I went back and I said, look, where's Sister Girl? Can I can I have another, you know, edition of it? I'll, I'm happy to do that. So um, I was working on that when I just about finished it and um, then we absorbed ourselves in, in the Jack of Hearts, but it was kind of like um, uh crazy if I can say I probably never want to do that again because you kind of you can give your whole self to 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 one book rather than uh thinking about two all the time and when I do writers festivals they either want me for this or for that mm. for either book usually never together but you that's know. because nobody thinks anybody's that crazy to publish yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right an amazing achievement that's you should crazy. be very proud of now, I have seen a note pop up saying there are a couple of questions. So we'll go to them and then I've got my own question to finish off with you too. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, the first question we've got, um, Jackie, is um, your father sounds like an amazing person and we are fortunate enough to be able to learn more about his life and the impact he made on it on community and during his service. Hmm. What do you think his reaction would have been to your book? Oh, that's a great question. Um yeah, I think he, he was so humble. I'm not sure whether he would have wanted us to write about it, but anyway, we did. Um, but, you know, I, I think he would be so proud of us, you know, and we've been told that by everyone, his old uh, friends and, and uh, our families, you know, he would have thought this is really lovely to bring it in line also with Mother's Book, which we believe is the companion book. So we've got both of them there together as that um, as that legacy, and I think he would have been uh, quite chuffed that um, after a while to say, "No, you don't need to write about me. What do you want to do that for?" and so forth. I think he would have realised the importance of doing that, and it's about also, you know, uh, there are not many books, not many books <laughs> out there that have been written by uh, Aboriginal um, people in service or in, in the Defence Force. Uh, we could only find one that was a biography of John Hill. He was a POW in, in the Burma Railway from West Australia. And, in fact, his great niece came along on the, the tour with us um, to, to, uh, to the railway. But there, there, there are very, very few uh, Indigenous uh, stories. I mean, everyone knows Captain Reg Saunders, I'm sure. Uh, great man. Um, there's been, uh, you know, uh, his has been really, um, you know, probably the, the uh, one of the highlights, but not much about... Um, and there have been works at the Australian War Memorial too in terms of... Um, doing uh, the uh, uh, indigenizing the war history from um, um, our point of view. So um, there have been a couple of books like that as well, plus other historians doing, but very, very few. So, and we've all had, it's a bit like the stolen generation, you know, we've all had and we've been affected by that. And for most um, uh, Indigenous families, we've all had an ancestor who has served in the uh, in the defence force, and at every level, our um, men and women have served from the Boer War right through to the current day conflicts in Afghanistan, um, in Iran, uh, etc. So they've always been there. So it's a kind of one of those little 
neglected history is that you know deserves far more attention but uh yes um you know uh, i'm sure our dad would have been uh, very proud of us thank you now kylie was there one more question uh yeah there's Before one more um and so that one's from this one's from emma she just wanted to thank jackie for sharing her dad's story with us all um i cannot imagine what he went through but he sounds like such a brave man I wonder if Jackie could share how she will commemorate Remembrance Day. Oh, thank you for asking. In fact, I was talking to Claire about this before we went on. Um, here, I live at a place called The Gap in Queensland and uh, in Brisbane, actually. And we've got lovely social networks. We had a community um, a gathering here for a launch in the park. Um, uh, after the official launch at Anzac Square. And uh, I said to the bookseller, look, probably bring 80 books, you know, that's that'll be good. Well, it was a rainy day, quite rainy, and we lost count of how many people turned up in the park, which was 230. So these wonderful people from our little community came. Now, um, the fellow who organised it, he runs the men's shed down here and he wants to have uh he's that we're going to do a dinner nari and i'll be as speakers with another gentleman um for remembrance day and uh, there'll probably be about 200 people uh, 150 200 people turning up at um, one of the local high schools here which they'll deck out for remembrance day but yes, and I must say, you know, Remembrance Day, Anzac Day has become a lot more special for me and uh, and my sister since we've written this book. Mm. But they are such bittersweet commemorations, aren't they? Because they are. as you say, you know, you are an anti-war essentially, you know. Oh yeah. I was and an now, at the same country. time you treat it so, you know, you your understanding of the time of what made those men go and serve and respectful of that patriotism or whatever it was that yeah. you, that, that made them stand up and and, and the women who mm. you know obviously went as well mm. um, you treat it very respectfully but at the same time obviously not wanting this to happen again in anyone's family as a as it happened for your own father I guess so what are you hoping just to finish that people really do take away from the reading of Jack of Hearts oh well I just think um people will take away um uh certainly this part of history that we we all need to um uh have a look at and come to terms with uh, as I say my father was treated very differently to other Aboriginal soldiers of the time. Um, but they didn't receive any soldier settlement grants um, like all the other uh, non-Indigenous soldiers did. Um, I think there were two in Victoria, but they were on swampland and, and nowhere else. Um, so, you know, that kind of, I think the the yin and the yang of uh, those stories is so important to, to, to hear and the bittersweetness of... Um, you know how how a, a person's life and um, can be so um, uh, so commanding, yet he has left us many legacies. So um, and the legacies that go through our family, that go through our communities too, and we want to share that history. You know, we're really very keen to share that history because you know, as you know, in our country. Oh, we're having treaty and referendums coming up, but people should know um, our aspect of truth telling. And uh, this is what this book and Sister Girl, you know, and most Aboriginal books, if not all, um, uh, do perform. They're performative and they do tell the stories that um, we should all know about. Thank you so much for telling your truth and sharing your father's truth. And while you fiddle around with your settings and maybe take it off blur so we can see the oh, cover yes, of I'll your, use these. Yes. your lovely dad, I'm going to say thank you again to thank you. the libraries for making this event possible. And thank you so much Thanks, to Dr. Libraries. Huggins yeah, for sharing very, this story and co-authored yeah. by my sister, obviously. Yes. Thank you so much. That's it. Okay. And thank you, Claire. And thank you to the libraries. Um, you do great work and thank you for 
you know, the role that you have in terms of servicing our communities as well. And thank you, everybody who's joined in tonight. It's been great. Uh, just before we leave tonight, I'd just yep. like to thank Jackie and Claire for speaking with us and also my partners at Latrobe and Miley Library Service for making this event happen. Just a reminder that you can borrow the book from any of our library services. Um, and if you're not a member of the library, either Latrobe City, Miley or East Gippsland, please sign up, support our services, which help us more in terms of resourcing and programming. Yep. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.